My name is Glenn Robitai, and I'm the Director of Ethics and Spiritual Care at Waypoint Center for Mental Health, as well as the Director of the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy, uh, Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program uh, for North Simcoe, Muskoka. Today, I'm going to be talking with you about therapeutic boundaries and the safe use of self. Uh, as I begin this workshop, I'll let you know that I'm going to be drawing from a number of different uh, areas, uh, parenting, uh, interpersonal relationships. Uh, it's important in understanding therapeutic boundaries to ground those in personal boundaries. And so I'm going to be uh, trying to establish what personal boundaries are all about. That will help us be more effective in the way that we relate to others in a professional way. So I have a thesis about healthy relationships that uh, when a relationship is healthy, it doesn't matter what kind it is, whether it's an interpersonal relationship uh, between partners or uh, parents to children, or uh, whether that would be a professional relationship with a colleague or a caring relationship like we would have with a patient. When it is a healthy relationship, people know where they begin and the other ends. So healthy relationships, they respect the separation between the self and the other. And because they do that, they're able to protect their personal space and at the same time remain sensitive to the needs of others. So that's my thesis about healthy relationships on the whole. Now we're all not able to do that as well as we probably would like to do in ideal, in the ideal. So in order to prepare for this workshop, I'd like to do some personal reflection, beginning with the idea of what kind of, per, of interactions hit your hotspot. And by that, I mean, what kind of engagement with others is most likely to produce a response from you that is unmeasured? And to give you an example, I can be driving into work in the morning and uh, they can be backed up on Fuller Avenue, 25 cars deep, and the one at the front could be going much slower than I would like to be going if I was you know, able to drive at the speed I'm most comfortable with. And I'm okay with that. But if someone passes me and then slows down, I find that very annoying. And uh, when that happens, I have to remember who I am. So uh, that's an example for me of something that I need to keep close tabs on uh, when someone obstructs my way and makes it difficult for me to do that, which I would normally do. Also, what are the early warning signs for you that perhaps you're experiencing counter-transference with another person, whether that's positively or negatively. And so if it's negative, you just might have <clears throat> a sense of not really liking that person very much. Maybe you're connecting them in a subtle way uh, subconsciously with another relationship you have had that in, in a way maybe you're not being conscious of reminds you of that person. And then when it comes to positive counter-transference, maybe you're just feeling drawn to them a bit uh, maybe you want to spend a little more time with them than you ordinarily would. You have a desire to impress them. Uh, this can happen in any context of any relationship. And that be an example of positive uh, counter-transference, which can be just as dangerous as the other. Uh, thirdly, who are the important people in your past that may have informed your self-concept? Maybe you can hear their voice. There are sayings that come to mind. They were encouragers for you. Maybe you're in the vocation you're in because of something they said. They told you what your strengths were and you believed that. And so you went down the, the vocational course that you've taken in your life. Uh, one of the ways to know if someone is one of these important people is that often when people are important to you, you will talk about them. You have probably shared this influence with other people. So keep in mind, what was it that they saw in you? What is it that you've owned from their perspective on you? And then finally, how do you think all of that material affects your relationship with others? Because it does. It does in your personal life. It will impact the way that you interact with, our, with your colleagues and with our patients. And uh, everyone has this background material that creates a, a baseline for how we view ourselves. So there are a number of different relationship styles that people take in the workplace. Uh, back in 1987, I did a workshop at uh, a Congress on counseling that I went to in Atlanta, Georgia. And one of the presenters was Dr. DeLoss D. Friesen from the University of Minnesota. And what he was doing is he was talking about um, 
who you could help and who you couldn't help. So his workshop was about identifying styles of personality, styles of relating uh, that respond well to certain kinds of approaches therapeutically. And I'm not gonna go through all 24 of his styles. I'm just pick a few of them here that relate well in a mental health context. See if you can find yourself in one of these. So the first one is what he called the random individualistic style. And so that's when there's a clear me and there's a clear you. They're two separate lanes. And they, they, when a person takes this posture as a professional in the workplace, uh, the strength of that is it's very objective and neutral. It's uncomplicated by the perspective of the other person. You know, you could think of Gregory House. I don't know if you've seen uh, that uh, drama that was on television back in the 2000s about this very talented diagnostician who had a really poor bedside manner. So he was good at identifying what was wrong with someone. He had no skills whatsoever in helping them to deal with whatever that was. So, but that's the strength. It's very objective and neutral. You could be perceived if you take that posture in the workplace as clinically cold and disengaged. And while some people probably would be okay with that, that doesn't often work well uh, in, in, in this environment. This would be the traditional medical model. That's called in his way of viewing things, the closed traditional model, closed because there's one perspective that matters and that's the perspective of the, of the person who's the clinician in this case. And it's traditional because it's based on their understanding of the world. So uh, the you or the patient in this case uh, or the client uh, doesn't really have much say in the relationship. And so the strength of that is it's very confident and reassuring. So some people, when they go to their physician or when they go to see a counselor or a psychotherapist, they're not much interested in being queried on what they think. You're the professional. Tell me what I need to know. Tell, tell me what I need to do and I will do it. <clears throat> so again, if that's what you're looking for, that can be very confident and reassuring. The perception could be as well that it's overbearing and inflexible. Uh, so while uh, some people might be drawn to that style, others could find it difficult and it could be counterproductive in the workplace. <clears throat> Excuse me. The synchronous serene is kind of the opposite of that. In this case, the it's the caregiver who is completely um, focused on the needs and the wants of the client or the or the patient. Uh, so again, this is very patient-centered. So uh, the person could be perceived as being, you know, fully zoned in on what the the person who's who's seeking help requires. Uh, but the problem with that is that you could also be perceived as enmeshed or needy. A person who is so dependent on being a, approved of by the client or the patient may not share the kinds of things that need to be shared to, to, for the well-being of the person. And so that could be a risk in the workplace, risk in the clinical environment as well. This is the open verbal style. Uh, in this one fits very well with the thesis I shared with you a few moments ago at the beginning, where there's a clear me and there's a clear you, and then there's this negotiated space called us. And that can either be larger or smaller, depending on the um, perspective of the of of the people involved. Uh, this is very recovery friendly and empathic because there is a focus on on the patient need or the client need, but it's also not so dependent on approval that it won't say what needs to be said in order to bring uh, us uh, um, a sense of reason or insight. Uh, the weakness to that, and I wrote this in wrong, is uh, you maybe you've heard the saying that a camel is a horse designed by a committee. Uh, so when there are too many perspectives and everybody's trying to get their way, it is possible that something that's intended to be sleek and fast ends up uh, a little bit slower and bumpier because it's trying to accommodate the perspective of others. But all things being equal, this is the recovery friendly approach. This is the one that's best used in our workplace, because as you probably have heard by now, Waypoint is a recovery-based environment. 
uh, we're seeking to follow the directives of the Mental Health Commission of Canada and take, uh, take on an approach that says nothing for the patient without the patient. So it's a collaborative model. Each one of these is dependent on us understanding the concept of boundaries. And a boundary is nothing more than something that fixes a limit or an extent, according to Webster's. It helps people to know where they begin and the others end. So we've all heard the saying, good fences make good neighbors. I can tell you that for a fact. I live on a corner lot. And when I first bought this house, I had three dogs. And people would cut across my backyard to get into the park that was behind me. And my dogs would sound the alarm each and every time, which can become very annoying if you're in the house. Tempt one to go out and tell people to please not walk through the back of your property. What I did instead was invested a few thousand dollars, put up a fence around the property, problem solved, the dogs were happy, I'm happy, and people no longer cut through the back of my yard. Uh, boundaries are something that define the connection of relationships, which basically means that we let some people get closer to us than others. It also defines the complexion of the relationship. We don't do the same things with everyone. There's certain things that we do with some people and don't do with others. And there's some things we'll do with that one special person that we won't do with anyone else. It's the boundary in the relationship that defines that for us. So the reason boundaries are important is they help to establish who we are in relation to other people. Boundaries also manage the distribution of power in relationships. And let's be clear, in every relationship, there are power dynamics. There's always a power dynamic. and uh, what Tony Campolo said about that uh, is that there's an inverse relationship between power and love. As one increases, the other decreases. And what that essentially means is that when you're asserting yourself, and sometimes we need to do that in all of our relationships, in parenting, uh, in caregiving, uh, sometimes uh, when you have uh, responsibilities in the workplace, you have to assert yourself to those who are accountable to you for something. But what we need to understand is that when we are doing that, when we are asserting ourselves, the other person is feeling less cared for. So that's an important principle to keep in mind, as we'll see in a few minutes. So if that's true, we need to understand the difference between assertiveness and aggression. So if I'm being assertive, what I'm doing is I'm defining and defending my personal space. Now, that's something I am obligated to do. I need to let you know what is comfortable for me. And so uh, uh, assertiveness is defining that. It also is defining what my values and ideals are. And again, I have to communicate those to you if I expect you to respect them. And also it is about expressing what I want and need. You know, often in relationships, when I was doing interpersonal relationships, so often people expected their partner to be a mind reader and you saw the ability to uh, discover what I want to need without being told what I want to need as evidence of love. And no, not everyone's that quick on the uptake. If uh, I want my needs and wants respected, I, I need to make clear what they are. So if you think about that in a clinical encounter, in order to, do, to protect somebody's boundaries, I need to know what's comfortable for them. I need to know what their values and ideals are. Culture, of course, plays an impact on that or plays a part in that. And I need to know what they want and need and vice versa. Aggression is something very different from that. If I'm being aggressive, I'm verbally imposing my will. I'm saying what I want, irrespective of what you may want. I could be physically imposing my will by using my size and strength advantage if I have one. And I could also geographically be aggressive by being where I'm not wanted and refusing to leave. Now, if you think about this in terms of a clinical encounter, uh, all of those are sometimes therapeutically mandated. So if there's a requirement for a lockup as example on the atrium side, something's going on that requires people to return to their room, uh, we may have to verbally say, we need everyone to return to their room. Uh, that's a requirement. Someone could perceive that as being uh, verbally overpowered. And, you know, if you've had three or four of those happen in one day, as sometimes might occur, it's easier to feel as though that's uh, being aggressive. 
We also sometimes have to lay hands on for someone's personal protection. We do have a least restraint approach at Waypoint, but it's not a no restraint approach. So when we lay hands and therapeutically it's required in order to protect a patient or to protect others, uh, it could be perceived as aggressive. And then finally, there are times when staff have to be on close observations with a patient or one-to-one. -one. It is required. They may, they may not see it that way. Uh, so uh, when in the course of just doing our job, it could be perceived as being aggressive. Uh, can't do much about that really, other than make sure we're talking things through and providing good communication. But as pre in a principle, this is just clip art. Uh, if we want to know quickly whether we're being assertive or aggressive, if we're assertive, the energy is in our comfort bubble and it's going out to the boundary deflecting unwanted energy. So energy is coming in, we're establishing, we're defining and defending our personal space and we're keeping out unwanted energy. If that's what we're doing, we're not being aggressive, we're being assertive. Aggression on the other hand, is the energy is going out from into that comfort bubble, uh, creating disturbance and by being unwanted in that particular place. So the fly in the ointment with that is again, it goes back to, we are obligated to let people know what's comfortable for us, what our values and ideals are, our values and ideals are, and what we want and need. Uh, if, you, if I don't do that, then I will probably do unto you as I would have you do unto me. So, Again, I used the example of a hug in a previous e-learn. If I'm a hugger and I'm comfortable hugging someone I meet when I meet them, I'm, I'm basically doing unto you as I would have you do unto me. If when I do that, you tell me, oh, not comfortable with that. Now I have information. So if I proceed to try and hug you this time or any other time after being told that, that is aggression. I'm taking my energy into your comfort bubble, treating you in the way that I would want to be treated. If I respect it, then the first one is just simply me not knowing what is comfortable for you and I need more information. So a lot of times we will learn from our patients and our clients what's comfortable for them, but we don't know it until we've actually done something that they find uncomfortable. And it's at that point that we have to learn and document and not do that again. We can be perceived as assertive or we can be perceived as aggressive in our statements. Assertive statements basically are things like this. I hear you, but this is what I need right now. So if I say that, I'm not being aggressive even though it could be perceived that way. I'm just telling you what I need. Uh, in a context where I've observed something that I'm not comfortable with, perhaps a situation where a colleague is being bullied by another, and I step up to the plate and I identify that. If I tell someone, listen, I heard what you said and I'm not comfortable with that. Or I heard what you said and I'm not okay with that. Again, it may make someone uncomfortable, but it's not an aggressive statement. I am telling you from my own space, what's comfortable for me. And when you bully someone, I'm not comfortable with that. So if I say I'm not willing or able to do that for you, maybe you want me to do it, Maybe you don't like that I'm not, but if I'm establishing from my own space, from my values, my ideals and my wants and needs, my level of comfortability, that I'm not willing or able to do that for you, that is not aggressive, that's assertive. If I say to you, tell me what you feel you need from me and I will consider it. So in other words, I'm not just jumping on board with what you're saying. Uh, tell me what you need. I'll think about it, I'll think it through and uh, I'll let you know, that's an assertive statement. Again, in all of these, there's the possibility for some tension because you're not doing necessarily what the other person wants, but you're standing on your own space. You're claiming your ground. So assertive statements are those that begin with I or the concept of I. Whether you use the word I or not, it's about you. It's not about the other person. So if I could illustrate that again, it's the energy flowing out from within my comfort bubble, deflecting unwanted energy. That is an assertive statement. Aggressive statements are different than that. Uh, they are you statements. So if I say you need to make some important changes in your life, well, you might say to me, 
Well, it makes you think you have any authority to tell me what changes I need to make. A, an aggressive statement is an arguable statement. So if it's an assertive statement, it really can't be argued with. Again, the person may not like it, but you can't tell me that I'm not uncomfortable. I'm the authority on what makes me comfortable or not. If I say you're acting like a real jerk, you could turn around and say, no, you're the one who's acting like a real jerk. So again, it's debatable. This concept, you are asking too much of me. If you say that to someone, maybe you say that to your supervisor or your boss, you're asking too much of me, they can come back with no. Maybe your last supervisor lets you get away with murder and I'm just uh, holding you accountable. So again, it's an arguable statement. If I say, if you applied these principles more consistently, you'd have better results. So again, I'm putting myself in the position of authority and you could tell me, go take a, a, a jump in the lake there. Who are you to tell me what principles I should be using? So with this concept of aggression, the energy flows in the opposite direction. I'm going into your comfort bubble unwanted and creating difficulty for you. So how do you flip those? Because there are times when you maybe feel like being a little more aggressive, but how can you uh, turn the energy uh, towards an assertive statement, which gives you a much better shot at being heard? So to use the examples I just used of aggressive statements, rather than saying you need to make some important changes in your life, you might say, I'm wondering if a couple of adjustments would benefit you. So I like that I do this a lot. If, if I say to you, I'm wondering, um, uh, I really am wondering, but I'm trying to give some feedback to you that you can either take or leave. So I'm wondering if a couple of adjustments would benefit you rather than you're acting like a real jerk. And you know, sometimes you may feel that way. Instead, talk about what is doing. You know, I'm finding it challenging to help you when you're yelling. I use this concept with patients when they are emotionally dysregulated. I will talk about wanting to be helpful. I'm having difficulty doing that while you're screaming or uh, whatever it is that I'm observing. Rather than you're asking too much of me, and that may be what you're feeling, you declare, this is what I'm able to do for you with your agreement. So you stay within the space that you can control. This is what I'm able to do. You know, as a rule of thumb, you don't make agreements that you can't keep just to save face in the moment or to get rid of negative energy. If you're not gonna do it, it's better to have the right fight at the right time for the right reason than the wrong fight at the wrong time for the wrong reason. Now think about that next time you're uh, thinking of having an argument with your partner or your significant other. Uh, this is what I'm able to do with you with your agreement. <clears throat> if you apply these principles more consistently, you'd have better results. Again, I'm back to wondering here. I'm wondering if these principles can help you to get the results you want. Or, you know, I've been thinking um, of a couple ideas that you know, might be helpful for you. Are you open to hearing them? So that's the way you want to word it if you want to be heard in a more assertive way. So when we talk about uh, relationships, the more intimate that relationship is, the smaller the comfort bubble, which just means you let some people get closer to you than others. There are some people you're so uncomfortable with, you probably don't want them within a million miles. There are others that, you know, really the separation between the two of you is not that great. It's also true that some people shouldn't get that close and we really need to watch our boundaries before we start energy that we can't stop. So <clears throat> kind of talk about that a bit. I created this intimacy grid back in 2008, I believe, and I uh, was using it as part of a relationship workshop I was doing in the community. It's just an illustration. It's not evidence-based. You know, people can agree or disagree with the four categories that I believe uh, work together to create intimacy. I see them as being responsibility, affection, expectations, and knowledge. So intimacy builds if I take responsibility for you, if I know a lot about you, if I expect things from you, and you expect things from me. And if I feel feelings for you that I might not feel for everyone. So if I'm a, in this quadrant here with someone who's an acquaintance as an example, I might have a little bit of knowledge about you. That's why it's pushed a little bit to the right. Um, and 
uh, because of that, I might have some increased expectation of at least your friendliness. But I don't really know you that well, so I don't need to necessarily like you. And I certainly don't have any responsibility much for you. Things start to switch when you get into this red zone here. Uh, that's where our intimacy is high and where all of these factors are working together. So it, you, know, you think about your most important people in your life, your family, your friends, your uh, spouse or partner, if you happen to like them. That's all in this red zone here. I like to use a very simple formula uh, for remembering this. It is, if I tell you about myself, things that I'm not telling other people, and if I make myself vulnerable to your reaction, because once you tell people things about yourself, it's kind of out there, you lose a little bit of control of it. But if I'm willing to make myself vulnerable and do that, I am increasing intimacy in the process. So <clears throat> what happens is uh, people come to work. Some of you will be working 12 hour shifts. You'll spend more time with the people on your teams than you will with your own families. And when that happens, with a lot of time sometimes, because uh, not all of the work is really active hands-on. There are times when we're doing a lot of custodial kinds of things. It may be tempting to start sharing uh, deep and personal things that you ordinarily wouldn't do. When you trade knowledge and make yourself vulnerable to somebody's reaction to that, you are unwittingly increasing intimacy. And when that happens, you know what you find is that some people are, without it, intending to, find themselves breaking up families and uh, ending relationships and creating difficulties in the life that they didn't want. You say, well, that doesn't happen, does it? Yeah, happens quite a bit, actually. Happens in every workplace. If you don't want it to happen, make sure you're watching the small signals around uh, knowledge and vulnerability. Uh, because uh, once you stop watching those pennies, the dollars add up pretty quickly. Here's the therapeutic sweet spot when you're working with colleagues or with our patients or clients. It's in the area where there's high responsibility. We all have roles and with that comes responsibility. And in order to do our work, we may need to know things. Uh, we don't necessarily need to tell them things about ourselves, but we need to know things about them. Uh, we don't necessarily expect anything from them from a personal point of view. Uh, they don't necessarily expect anything from us personally and we don't necessarily have to like them. It's not about that. It's all about doing our jobs and knowing what we need to know in order to do them well. <clears throat> so when it comes to protecting professional boundaries, it's important to remember that friendships are mutual. They're based on meeting each other's needs. There's give and take in those kinds of relationships. Therapeutic relationships are not mutual it's all about the patient and us taking care of things that develop their well-being. Back in 1988, the College of Psychologists of Ontario said that except for those behaviors of a sexual nature or an obvious conflict of interest, boundary considerations are often not clear cut, <clears throat> particularly in a rural area like ours. We may have to think sometimes about the relationships that we have, uh, shirt tail cousins, people that we might know in the community but don't have deep relationships with but they always require us to think things through very carefully and make sure the decisions we're making are in the best interest of the client. And again, if we're functioning in the best interest of the client in a recovery-based organization, then nothing for the patient without the patient. It's including their perspective on things. So when we violate boundaries, we can either do that passively by denying legitimate care or we can do that actively by causing unnecessary discomfort in another. People often miss this denying legitimate care. When people have care that we're obligated to give and we don't give it, that is therapeutic abandonment. And that is a boundary violation. It is care to which they are entitled. So if we should be involved, but not over involved, how involved should we really be? Well, this professional behavior continuum says about as well as it can be said, because it's not a strongly objective thing. But if we look at it from the context of over-involvement, uh, possibly being therapeutic enmeshment, you know, some of that stuff we talked about early, of uh, positive transfers, transference may be happening. We happen to like this person more, so we spend more time with them. 
or under involvement, which is therapeutic abandonment, uh, there's this place called the zone of helpfulness, which basically says that somewhere between Patch Adams, uh, you know, the movie where the medical student sets up his own clinic and actually takes people home to live with them, and under involvement, and going back to that Gregory House idea where he's doing his job, but he's not bringing a human connection. There is that place where you can actually be helpful by being a human being and bringing humanity to our care without being over or under involved. Therapeutic boundaries recognize that when patients come to us, they are vulnerable. And they're vulnerable to us because we as clinicians have influence and power, sometimes that we don't know that we even have. Uh, something that can be exploited by us and used, even unwittingly. So we have to be careful with that. And we think about patients coming in for the first time uh, into an environment like ours. Uh, some have been here many times before. This wouldn't apply to everyone who is a patient here. <clears throat> but most people coming in for the first time would relate to this at some level. So they're coming from an environment of low con of uh, of high control. I mean, they basically did what they wanted to an environment of low control and in some cases no control. Think of what that would be like. They're afraid because they don't know what's going on. Uh, they could be uh, in pain in different ways, physically, psychologically, and emotionally. You know, we tend to think if they're coming in, there's a problem that has to do with, you know, their, their uh, mental state. Uh, but it's like that Lyrica commercial that was on several years ago when they were using it as an antidepressant. Now it's mostly a smoking cessation aid. But back in the day when they were advertising, they would say, where does depression hurt? And they'd say everywhere. And who does depression hurt? Everyone. So um, that's uh, uh, the way some of our patients are when they first come in. They may have other specific health concerns as well, comorbidities. You show, show me someone who's just been uh, uh, brought into a mental health facility for the first time, and I'll show you a, li a high likelihood of a disrupted family support system because they don't know what's going on. By the time it gets to the point that they're coming here, a lot of water under the bridge often, and there's often help required there as well. A lot of catastrophizing goes with a diagnosis of mental illness. So there's esteem, confidence, and dependency needs that are suddenly in question. People see the, you know, the uh, minivan and the, the boat and the family vacations and the nice home with the fence around it going out the door. And sometimes they actually do find that occurs, but not always. But most often when people come in, they are worried about that, that at some level. So how do we breach the boundary with, our, with each other and with our patients? Well, we can do that verbally through inappropriate communication and jesting flirting, you know, all of those kinds of things. And you might say, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, here's the thing. The longer you are in relationship with someone, uh, the easier it is for that to happen. The old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. It breeds more than that. And I wish I could say that I've never, fell, never fallen prey to this. Um, but yeah, I've had these, uh, this occur myself. Uh, there was a man that I worked with as part of a television program back in the 80s on bipolar disorder that came to be a friend of mine. His name was Len Wood. He passed away five or six years ago, but um, I'm going to share an event that happened with him and ha have his permission to do that. Um, I had added him to our ethics committee as a community, as a community voice. And uh, so one day he comes in the ethics committee. There were very few people in the room. And as he comes in, I said, how are you doing, Len? And he said, Eminem, my friend, Eminem. And I said, does that mean sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't? You know, that old Eminem's commercial. It just popped into my mind. And immediately I saw the shock on his face and he said, no, that means marvelous and magnificent. And I can't believe that you of all people just said that to me. And of course, he's right. I mean, if that was a new person that had just come to our facility and had said the same thing. There's no way I would have ever pulled that out of my hat. Instead, because I did, I spent the rest of that day and much of the next picking black feathers out of my teeth, uh, eating crow and trying to make things right, which I eventually did. But the point of it is, you know, he had to be gracious with me because I allowed my longstanding relationship with 
him to make me casual. And the longer you're in relationship with someone, the easier it is to do that. You can do it physically through inappropriate touching. And inappropriate touching is any touching that is not wanted. Any touching that is not initiated without knowing the perspective of the person. Uh, and then finally, you can do it sexually by forming romantic attachments, either physically or emotionally. I've talked enough about that. You say, well, that doesn't happen with our patients, does it? Yeah, it does. It doesn't happen all that frequently, but quite a few times in my career, this has occurred. You know, human beings form human relationships. If you don't watch the pennies, you know, even with our patients, you can start spending a lot of econ a lot of uh, a lot of uh, relational cash that maybe you can't afford to pay. Uh, touch always has an impact. So we have to be careful when we're using even therapeutic touch uh, because it always changes the interaction. Uh, when we do touch, we keep in mind that it's all about the patient's comfort zone. Even on those times when we have to, we should be getting good information as to what would make that easier for the person. Uh, there's not an exact formula for it. And there are cultural implications that often come into play. So before we use our hands in a therapeutic way, in any way whatsoever, it's always best to understand the culture, understand what we need to know, or uh, run the risk that our behavior will be misinterpreted and perhaps, perhaps create some harm. As I mentioned, different cultures have different norms around these things. In some cultures that we will see uh, men and women cannot touch. Uh, we see the province here uh, at Waypoint because of our provincial program. We see every demographic available in the province of Ontario over time. So we definitely need to know these things. Uh, our spiritual care team does a cultural and spiritual intake for every admission of over 72 hours. We can glean this information and give it to the, the, uh, the various teams so we understand what they need from us when they're in our care. Uh, different norms around kissing and hugging. Uh, same physical behavior. That means nothing in one culture can be very seriously uh, a problem in another. So keep that in mind. It's uh, healthy to have a human relationship with our patients. There's a difference between blurring boundaries and going way too far and actually having casual conversations what I like to call shooting the breeze. It's in talking with our patients about nothing that we gain the opportunity to talk to them about meaningful things. If the only time we talk to them is to tell them something or to ask them something, that's not therapeutic engagement. So we need to be talking with them about things that really aren't that significant. So you can share from your life as long as you're using things that are way in the distant past if you're gonna talk about an event, um, my house burned down when I was eight years old. I, yeah, that was a difficult time for our family. That's pretty low key. Uh, I went through a really serious um, issue of sexual abuse or physical abuse. That's a little too much information. That's the kind of thing that can flip the, um, the script so that now the patient feels some obligation to feel for you. We don't wanna do that. We are the caregivers. We're bringing our, our care to them. We're not asking them to care for us. So talk about the hockey game, talk about the movie you just saw. Uh, if they ask you if you have kids, that's up to you whether or not you wanna share that. I have and I haven't and under, certain, under certain circumstances depending on how I thought it would change the relationship. And that's always the key. Keep in mind that when you do share personal information it could feel to the client as if there's an exchange happening between two friends so you wanna to go to that level. You always have to be considering how, if I, do, if I do share this, how are things gonna change between us? Every college has standards of practice around dual relationships. The College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario basically says uh, you avoid dual relationships. Uh, once you form a relationship of one kind, you don't morph it into a relationship of another kind, you stay in your lane. And again, because we're in a rural area where you can uh, have admissions of shirt tail cousins and people maybe you are acquainted with, uh, you have to use your own uh, professional judgment in, in working with the patient, recognizing they have feelings on it too. If you have any concerns at all about that, you make sure you talk with your manager, other team members, 
be willing to step back if needed. When it comes to gift giving, the basic rule of thumb is you don't take gifts. Uh, every college would say that. Uh, college registered psychotherapist doesn't support it unless it would create harm if the gift was refused. Uh, but there's still things to take into consideration around even that. Uh, so anytime a gift is being received of any kind, you can solve with team members. Um, again, uh, the value of the gift, uh, the inherent meaning of it. If someone brings in a plate of cookies, take that plate of cookies, stick it on the nursing station. If people want to take it, you know, have a, a cookie, it's up to them. They certainly don't have to. Uh, but if someone brings in a real expensive item, it's something we just can't take. Uh, the principle is this idea of conflict of interest. We have to remain alert to the possibility that we could be seen as exploiting a patient, whether or not we were actually doing so. Uh, again, inherent social meaning and the legality has to be considered, the value, uh, the circumstance of the person who's giving the gift, and always make sure whether you take it or not that any offer of a gift is properly documented in a way that uh, explains exactly what happened very objectively. So to reduce the risks, you can ask yourself these questions. Whose best interests are driving this approach, whatever that is? Whose needs are being served? Is this about me, some need that I have in me? Uh, if I was to tell a colleague exactly the approach that I'm taking with this client, would I be comfortable with that or would I be tempted to kind of shave the edges a bit? Same thing with documentation. If I can't document something exactly the way that it happened, um, then I probably shouldn't be doing it at all. And then finally, think about how it would look to the patient's family if you did this. Uh, keep those, those, those uh, five questions in mind if you're having any confusion, because generally uh, what you're willing to disclose openly and honestly is probably one of the best windows into whether or not it should be that being done at all. Always be aware when you're engaging with someone of your own needs, values, and attitudes. That's why we did that exercise at the beginning. Know what sets you off. Know who, you, who appeals to you and who doesn't. Know when you're capable of interjecting emotion that doesn't belong. Uh, if you are ambivalent, if you're experiencing any kind of confusion, discuss them op that openly with other team members or with your manager. And when it is necessary, be willing to step back from areas of potential risk. No one's gonna fault us for that if we're doing good due diligence in arriving at that decision. If you have to set boundaries, it's important to make it an event. You wanna set it clearly and succinctly. I like this concept of eye contact and proximity. So again, if I could use an example uh, from parenting this time, uh, if you have a child, let's say five years old and you're in the kitchen, maybe preparing dinner, whatever the case may be, and uh, that child is in the other room playing with toys and you say, hey, uh, Johnny, clean up your toys, wash your hands and please come to dinner. What are the chances that's going to happen? Well, in most cases, not very good because you're, you're speaking from the other room. It's hardly an event and it's very casual and it's very easy to be felt and seen that way. If on the other hand, you get up and you go into the other room and you give that child some eye contact and with a smile on your face, you say, Johnny, we're gonna eat. Please clean up your stuff right now. Go wash your hands and come to dinner. What, are those, what is the likelihood that's going to happen? Well, certainly much better. Certainly not foolproof either, but much better. When you set boundaries with our patients, expect a measure of resistance from some, some testing, some guilt tripping. Um, uh, they're not accustomed to someone setting a boundary and maintaining it. They're accustomed to inconsistency. Uh, for instance, we have A teams and B teams. How A teams do things is often different than how B teams do things. Some of them don't necessarily recall whether it's the A team or the B team, what the rules are between the two. So when you say no, or when you set a boundary, they may test it until they know for sure. Uh, years ago, we had a patient who used to go through, go to each office looking for something. It was part of, a, um, part of the, the diagnosis the person had uh, to collect things. And so this person also came to my office and every single time I'd have to say, 
uh, say no and then have a discussion about me being mean and all of that. So finally I said, uh, I'll, call, I'll call the person Karen. I said, listen, Karen, um, I want you to know that you can trust me. I will never give you anything. And she says, what do you mean? I said, you can trust that every time you come here, no matter what, I will never, ever, ever give you anything. I'm not going to, I'm not going to hurt you that way. And she says, that's not going to hurt me uh, if you give me something. And I said, well, I'm not going to give you something. So giving you the, the idea that one of these times I might is it's really mean for me to do that. So I'm just gonna be honest with you. I will never give you anything, no matter ever, ever again. If no matter how many times you come, I am not going to give you anything. And she says, you're mean. And I says, no, I'm being kind. So she continued to come and visit me nearly every day. She stopped asking me for things. And as a result, we had a much more pleasant relationship. It was a case where a boundary needed to be set and not setting one uh, was causing harm to this person. Finally, if you do set a boundary, make sure you do it. Worst thing you can do is set a, a, a limit or a boundary and then not maintain it. Uh, in you know, the principle of operant conditioning, the worst thing you can do is stagger the reward. You know, in Pavlov's experiments, when he filled the bowl uh, and, the dog, and rang the bell and the dog associated the feeding of the, uh, the, the receiving of food with the ringing of the bell, he eventually became very lazy, but once he started to stagger it, you know, ring the bell and not put food in it, anxiety went up and because the dog didn't know whether uh, it was going to be fed or not. So we don't want to do that to anyone uh, because that's how human beings function as well. If you stagger the reward, you're going to create anxiety. If you set boundaries, do it quickly. It's not going to get any better with time. If you do set that boundary and it is not respected, address it immediately. Um, no sense putting that off either. Every time you do a response, you're teaching the person how you're going to treat them. And when you do address it, don't talk about the behavior itself in a way that induces shame or infantilizes the patient. If you're objecting, give the reason. Uh, if you can't give a practical reason, you probably shouldn't be given the limit. So explain the reason why the limit exists and that will help a person to respect it more. Some of our patients are going to easily respect those boundaries. <clears throat> other people won't. For some of our patients, finding ways to challenge others, uh, challenge the staff is what gets them up in the morning. So uh, uh, make sure you uh, recognize that. Again, going back to sometimes this positive transference, uh, setting boundaries can challenge our need to be well received. We want to be liked. So we have to be careful with that, about that. And if we have any ambivalence about any of these things with any of our patients, make sure we talk with our manager. So I'm just gonna share a couple of vignettes before we end, put this into um, some context. And again, this would be much better done if you were here to respond um, and ask questions. But as it is, I'll just share a few thoughts. Here is one that is common if you're gonna live in this area. Under normal circumstances, we have something called shop and show where uh, our patients go into the community and are able to go to the Galaxy Theater or to Walmart or some other place. And you may encounter them on a Tuesday night if you are out and about. And so in this particular scenario, you are at a restaurant with friends and are seated at a table adjacent to where a former patient and her family are sitting. She brings her teens to your table and greets you, apparently hoping to be introduced. So again, there are boundary situations here. You have them, your friends and family who are with you have them, and the patient who's bringing you, uh, bringing her, her teens to meet you has boundaries as well. So people often get confused about whether or not they can actually introduce the people who are with them. And the answer is yes, you can if you want to. That's your boundary. You are the one who can decide whether or not you're comfortable introducing the people who are with you. Uh, the other person gave implied consent by coming to your table to acknowledge that you know them. But the former patient has boundaries as well. The, the patient hasn't, the former patient hasn't said anything about identifying them as a former patient. So you can acknowledge you know them, but you can't acknowledge how you know them. And 
So again, you don't have to introduce anyone. You can just um, engage the person, um, but you can if you want to. Uh, uh, this happened to me so many times in the community when my wife was with me that she finally came to understand that if someone comes up to me and I don't introduce her, she should walk away and I'll catch up with her. And for me, going back to what I said earlier, if I didn't think it would change the relationship and I had no concerns about what that might mean uh, in terms of my wife, I would introduce the person. If I had any concerns about that at all, she would know if I wasn't addressing her uh, that that's what she should do. She should walk away. So it's kind of up to you to decide in a situation like this whether you're comfortable or not. Finally, this is a little more complex. You have a patient with a history of abuse and rejection by her mother who forms a strong attachment to a female nurse. And at Christmas, she unexpectedly gives that nurse an expensive crystal pendant and a card which reads, you have been a wonderful help to me. Please accept this token of my appreciation. So again, if we look at this therapeutically, we do have a person who has a history of rejection and abuse from her mother. So rejection is a problem. You know, she's brought a gift. Obviously, she's invested some, something of her personal feelings into it. It's a point where someone can be uh, injured uh, by a rejection of that gift. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, at the same time, we have to recognize that this rejection was from her mother and that the person being given this gift is uh, a female nurse. Now, it doesn't mean that for sure we have a case where she's projecting something of her relationship with her mother onto this nurse, but it's a possibility, at least that we have to keep in mind. We also have to keep in mind that it's an expensive crystal pendant. It's not a plate of cookies. It's not something that can be placed on the nursing station. So the bottom line is, no, we cannot accept this gift, but we have to be able to inform the person of that in a way that protects their dignity and does the, the most that we can to reduce the possibility of her experiencing rejection. So in a situation like this, I like to recommend the sandwich method. Some of you may know this method. The sandwich method, method basically says you start with uh, something that validates the person and without using the word but, you tell them the truth. You tell them what they need to know and then you validate again on the other side. That way, um, you're acknowledging the person, uh, dealing with the potential for rejection, but you're also maintaining your professional boundaries. So in this case, I may say something like, wow, I'm so pleased to know that the care that you received here is meaningful to you. That means a lot to me and to the team. I can't accept the gift. It's against the standards of the college to receive gifts. Um, it would be a violation of my professional ethics to do so but I'm so pleased to know that you thought of me and that you found the care that was provided to you meaningful. And then in this case, because she gave you a card, you can even say, I'm gonna keep this card. Thank you for giving this to me. And uh, that may or may not do the trick. I find that when I've used this uh, approach, sometimes people out of embarrassment will come at it and oh, you really try to impress on me how much they want me to have it. Uh, but again, you sandwich them each and every time. Each and every time you, you weaken the blow by giving affirmation and without using the word but, because the word but says everything I just said before this is pure rubbish, this is the piece that is important. No, you just want to weave in the truth in between your appreciation. So thank you for your attendance and your, uh, your attention today. Again, this is my personal information. Feel free to call me or to email me if you have any comments or questions. Have a great day.